So this will be great. So my, as I mentioned, most of my care is outpatient. I also do some inpatient hospital work. So this will kind of span a lot of different realms and I think be pertinent to everybody. So we'll talk specifically about the role of telemedicine for chronic disease management. I'll use hypertension and diabetes as sort of the example of disease state um, as there's been a good amount of work done in that way. So disclosures, I, my only disclosures are grant support. So through the HRSA and the Center for Telehealth Excellence that MUSC is one or two national centers for, and then also through the South Carolina Telehealth Alliance. And objectives of the talk, I want to define telemedicine, telehealth. Uh, I think some of those terms are still a little bit ambiguous for a lot of people. Then we'll look at the rationale for telemedicine services and particularly how that might, telemedicine might be a potential solution for some of the problems and the barriers that a lot of our patients are facing, especially in terms of receiving primary care. And then finally, hit on some imp implementation and integration issues that you might face as you try to bring these into your practice. So defining the terms telehealth versus telemedicine, I do want to give a disclaimer that there is a lot of controversy about this, um, but in general, people think of telehealth as the sort of over um, or all-encompassing clinical uh, care, also research, academic, public health policy, whereas telemedicine really falls within that and has to do particularly with the clinical care aspects. This can be broken largely into three main categories. You'll see here mobile health, synchronous care, and asynchronous. And within each of those broad categories, there are a number of different types of telemedicine services that you might be exposed to. So why focus on telemedicine? My interest initially became um, through the route of looking at disparities in care and particularly looking at our outpatient internal medicine population in regards to hypertension and then expanded into diabetes and other chronic disease management, particularly through the role of telemedicine. Uh, as you know, we all, uh, being in the Southern Medical Association, we know that the prevalence of hypertension is rampant in our area, as you can see based on the blue in this chart. And similarly, diabetes prevalence also rampant in the, in the constituents that we're treating. This is a map of heart disease mortality, so it parallels the prevalence. And this is clearly something that we must address. And diabetes is a little bit more spread out, looking at the dark red here, that's where the highest mortality rate with regards to diabetes lie. Uh, we're spreading the wealth a little bit through the rest of the country, but still pretty predominant in the southern region. Unfortunately, the same type of trend goes for the reverse. So the white states have the lowest ratio of primary care provider to patient population. So right where we really need our general practitioners and our primary care exposure, is exactly the same areas where we're not getting it. So really a huge challenge and a huge, uh, I would say, a, a challenge for us primary care providers to try to deliver care to the, for a very large number of patients who are suffering from very severe disease. So telemedicine, I would, I would bargain, is a very possible solution, or perhaps not a solution, but certainly a great tool that we should all use and have in our tool belt. So here's our, area within the Southern Medical Association. As you know, we often have our physicians, our providers, who may be located only uh, concentrated within academic institutions in the state and then through other smaller practices or healthcare institutions. Unfortunately, our patients are really uh, spread out anywhere and may be traveling three hours to get to you. Uh, so we have a lot of barriers that those patients are facing, whether that's a financial barrier, a geographic and transportation barrier, health literacy barriers, and then finally, just scheduling and trying to fit a whole bunch of things in. And, and really, we're trying to compel our patients to recognize the importance of this. So how can we get around some of those? I would say that telemedicine is certainly one option. So where do we stand? Where is the US these days in terms of telemedicine and delivery of these services? Based on the American Telemedicine Association's most recent data, there are about 200 telemedicine networks in the country. Uh, with almost 3,500 service sites. About a million remote cardiac monitors are currently in service, in circulation in the United States. The Veteran Health Association, or Administration, excuse me, also has a lot of experience with telemedicine services. As of 2011, they documented 300,000 consultations through telemedicine, and you can imagine that, being, that statistic being seven years old, that number is probably quite a bit higher now. 
more than half of hospitals use some form of telemedicine. Now that is widely defined in terms of what service that might be. But again, a, a little bit of an old data, uh, data point, especially as you consider how the trajectory of telemedicine uptake has been over the last several years. In 2015, about 60% of Americans were reported that they tracked health data through a mobile application or other uh, techno technological device. So what do we know about how patients are? So are patients willing to even use this type of service? This was a study that shows overwhelmingly yes. The answer is yes. 94 to 99% of patients stated that they were satisfied, actually very satisfied with telemedicine provision. When they looked particularly surveying those same patients as to whether they preferred the visit or simply liked the visit, so almost 30% or excuse me, almost a third of patients actually preferred the telemedicine service over the traditional office <laughs> visit, which I think says a lot. And then another almost 60% said that they liked telehealth. Maybe they wouldn't prefer it, but they did like it. What do physicians feel? What do uh, physician <clears throat> provider groups say? So this was a perspective piece published in the New England Journal earlier this year, actually in January. This really was a call to healthcare institutions health systems and to providers to embrace this new form of technology and healthcare provision, they really made an appeal that they felt people and providers who embraced telemedicine and brought it in would have deeper and richer relationships with their patients and would be providing better care. So what's the evidence behind telehealth? Does, what does it do for us? Does it really change health outcomes? There is evidence to show that it improves access, cost effectiveness, quality of life, social support, many of those being by patients, others being by um, data driven in terms of the cost analysis. The best evidence really falls within remote patient monitoring and chronic care management. So those are, we'll get to an example that we've employed here at NUSC, which really will get at both of those things. Speaking specifically of blood pressure monitoring, so we all know that there's been a, a vast amount of literature suggesting that home blood pressure monitoring is effective and is useful. This specifically looks at telemonitoring, whereby those numbers would be automatically transmitted for a provider to review, and showed that there was a, a significant difference in the reduction of the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Caveat to this is that this meta-analysis was done in only 23 studies, and the follow-up time period was quite variable, going anywhere from eight weeks to two years, so just know that there, there is a little bit of heterogeneity there. But it also did report a larger proportion of patients achieving blood pressure normalization at the end of the study periods when they looked at it through this meta-analysis. Diabetes only has evidence to support the use of mobile applications and other telemedicine services. This was, again, a systematic review and a meta-analysis looking at the A1C reduction over time, and there was a significant reduction seen in the studies as much as 2%. And again, the, the time of follow-up was variable. So what is NUSC doing in terms of telemedicine telehealth services? And we have over a decade of a decade's worth of experience with telemedicine services, but really in 2013 is when things became very formalized and much more robust. That was when the South Carolina legislature actually funded the South Carolina Telehealth Alliance. And USC was charged with orchestrating and organizing that telehealth alliance, but the group really it expands across the state and involves other healthcare institutions across the state, so it's a collaboration effort. This slide is simply meant to just show the breadth of live video services that can be provided. Certainly there are other ones that NUSC is not currently involved in that may not be represented here, but this really shows that there are provider to provider or health system to health system consultations and collaboration through telemedicine and video services, whether that's to an outlying hospital, to an outpatient clinic, or to other non-clinical sites such as schools, uh, prison facilities, nursing facilities, etc. There are also other non-video based services, so store and forward, um, you often see this with EKGs for example, and then you've got remote patient monitoring and mobile health. Important to note that the remote patient monitoring and the mobile health, uh, the distinction there is that you're actually communicating directly with the patient. So rather than providers or healthcare groups communicating through the telemedicine services, this is really bringing technology directly to the patient 
and giving a clear communication pathway directly to the provider. So I'd like to take a little bit of time just to go into a, a program that I've been involved in and that I'm heading up through the state of South Carolina because I think this gives a good example of how you might implement this and what the implications might be. So the goal is to develop a sustainable and scalable solution for diabetes and hypertension management for patients who are low income, rural, otherwise have difficulty getting in for care. This is a picture of the device that we use. It has a glucose meter you can see up at the top, a little glucose tip sticking out, and then it also has a blood pressure cuff all built into one device. The beauty of this device is also that there is a SIM card embedded within it, so there are no cords for the patient. There's no requirement for them to have Wi-Fi technology, Bluetooth technology, or a smartphone. Um, so it pings off any cell phone tower and sends the data um, for our review. The cost is not as much as you might expect, so it's $150 for the device itself, and then there's a $10 a month maintenance fee, which includes the coverage for the SIM card payment and then the device, uh, or excuse me, the website maintenance. So the workflow, I don't want to get into all the nitty gritty of this, but how we have brought this through is that we screen our patients, um, and we, we have, I'll show a slide in just a moment where I'll show all the clinic sites that we're utilizing across the state. But we screen patients for a qualifying A1C. We use an A1C of greater than eight. And then we reach out to them and ask if they're <coughs> willing to participate. If so, we go ahead and get them set up with a the device. They get education on it. They go home and they're instructed to use the device. Uh, once a day is what we ask. And then we have access to the website. The web, the, it's a HIPAA compliant web server where we can go on and actually set our own threshold or algorithm for what we think is concerning if a value is exceeded, and then we can run the report. We'll get a report of the patient, and then we'll begin reach out. So twice a week, we'll reach out to those patients who are most severely uh, exceeding those targets, and then we'll uh, look at their current treatment regimen. We'll make a recommendation for a lifestyle change or a medication management, call the patient, relay those results, and then they go on and continue monitoring. So the number, this program, as you can see, the device itself is very user friendly, very simple to do. We have had tremendous growth just over this calendar year. So on the far, I guess it would be on your left side, uh, you'll see January of 2018, we started with just over 200 patients and really we're uh, over 600 now. So patients are really taking this on, providers love it because it gives them another tool and so it's easy for them to get data. You don't have to worry about the patient forgetting to bring their glucometer in for the appointment, to review, et cetera. This is a map of the state, and all the spokes out of the map are different clinical sites that we are collaborating with who have patients enrolled in the program. Some of them, we began with free clinics, volunteer clinics, uh, as we really wanted to get to a patient population that otherwise is having difficulty receiving this care. And then we branched out to SQHCs, which have provided a large number of patients, and then there's um, our MUSD University Internal Medicine Clinic is the single academic affiliated site that's involved. So you might be concerned about what am I going to do with all of this information? Patients are already calling me, they're calling me every time I take my blood pressure, my blood sugar, what am I gonna do with all this data? It's gonna overwhelm me. Well, this shows that there is a whole lot of data coming in. So this is a month, this is how many data points are coming in on a monthly basis through the program. So as we just looked at, we have about 600 patients, and you can see now that every month we're getting about 13,000 data points. Each data point might be a blood glucose, it might be a blood pressure measurement. But what's the impact then? So this is the A1C change over six months. This is a sample of five of our clinics who have completed over six months worth of follow-up time so that we can have numbers come back. And as you can see, it's pretty remarkable change. We do not mandate medication changes. We let each clinic make their own recommendations or have their own algorithm for how they're going to address this. Sometimes providers have come together and voted on a standing order algorithm so that a, a nurse can actually make the changes under those directions. Uh, other clinics, so for example, at MUSC and internal medicine clinic, we brought this into the resident telehealth curriculum, and so the residents actually monitor the data and then make the changes, so you have an MD making those changes with precepting faculty supervision. Um, so it's done in a number of ways, but everywhere you can see has pretty dramatic A1C changes. 
And so you wonder, what? well, is it just the attention? Um, is it just the patients are paying more attention to it now that you're using this device? Well, we, we have access to our university internal medicine clinics and UIM clinic data. And what we did was look back at how many medication changes were associated with these, with the review of the remote data. And over that time period, we have almost 250 medication changes. So that would suggest that we are actually picking up on abnormal values and being able to make treatment changes in the intra-visit period. So rather than waiting for that three month follow up to come back or worrying about the patient not showing up to clinic because maybe they've missed their transportation or, a, or some other barrier. Systolic blood pressure, I would say, has a significantly more modest effect. Uh, this was at six months. Um, but I think the caveat and one thing to consider in this is that we did not have a blood pressure entry criteria. So the eligibility to be enrolled in the program was simply an A1C greater than eight. So the baseline blood pressure actually wasn't that high in many of these patients. So not so your providers you know, certainly aren't trying to drive you 10 points lower if you're starting at 120 necessarily. Um, and the same thing with the diastolic blood pressure. You do see some reduction, though. I will, I will note that. Particularly, you'll note that the clinics where you started higher, so particularly that Abbeville uh, clinic, you'll see that they, they are dropping because they're starting at a higher level and perhaps recognizing the need to make a change. So what's the future direction? What we're looking to do next, actually, is saturate high-need counties so that we can compare the high-need, the counties where every, where our goal would be to have every patient who has an A1C over eight to have one of these devices. Um, it really manages from a population health level. And then we'll compare the long-term outcomes for those counties versus others. Investigate the appropriate duration of monitoring. So our program was initially set out to follow people for 12 months, but who's to say 12 months is enough? Is it if you're not controlled, but you're still checking that we need to continue any longer? Or what patient population is it that's going to benefit from this long term? <coughs> and then streamlining the clinical workflow, cost and utilization analysis, obviously down the pipeline. So implementation, it's important to know what barriers you might face if you're looking to bring this into your clinic setting. So keys, really, you've got to have community input, and you've got to know your community resources. And we found that it's, it's critical that you have community community stakeholders that can really sort of vouch for you in the community and get get their uh, respective constituents on board. You've got to have clinic site champions as well. When you're talking about an intervention that's going to last a year or more, you need to have somebody that's going to be on the ground and reminding people to stay involved. Dedicated time and procedural protocol are also important. So a lot of people um, have various reasons for not wanting to adopt telemedicine. Um, this is one of the less cited, but um, it's our providers, we, we were interested in knowing kind of what were the behavioral patterns, what, what would make people um, want or not want to use telemedicine. So we surveyed our general internal medicine faculty, and you'll see that the majority, the vast majority, found that this was essential uh, to future practice. Residents must be trained on this. Those who felt not essential, they thought, well, it's still good to know. And then, but on the flip side of this, providers and the faculty members particularly didn't feel like they had the experience. So yes, we know that the next generation of providers, they need to know this, but we don't feel that we're experienced enough to do the teaching. Um, so that's what you see here. Most, most faculty felt they were telehealth novices. And then their comfort in utilizing it, similarly, very low. So non-existent or limited um, self-perceived ability to utilize these services. So this is, this is definitely an area that we need to spend some time in faculty development. Barriers identified by providers. So reimbursement constraints, as you can imagine, especially in some of the payment models for physician reimbursement, this is a significant concern if you're talking about adding on extra data to review, extra work, and how is that going to be reimbursed? Time, again, you have a busy clinic schedule, so when do you have time to look at this information and then call the patients up and send them a new medicine prescription? Uh, integration of the electronic health record with some of these outlying service providers is a problem. Unfamiliarity, and then interpreting and integrating the data. So who's to say, if your blood pressure is this in the outpatient setting, that this is really when you need to act? What if it's very high one day, but the next day it's very low? What do you do with that information? Equipment availability is another concern. So how do you get this technology to your patients? <coughs> I want to spend just the last bit of time talking about some of the reimbursement and policy uh, regulations around this because I think that is a huge barrier that a lot of people face when they, uh, or at least an intimidating factor when they think about bringing this in. So 
In, prior to 2018, Medicare had reimbursement policies for live video services. There, were, there are a lot of caveats with this, though. You have to be a certain provider. You have to be in an eligible originating site. You have to be giving this survey or giving this service to a um, eligible receiving site, and then it has to be uh, for specific patients in rural locations, and it's a bundled payment. So that was all through the use of GP Montplus. You can find whether or not you are one of these specific rural locations by using this website at the top, data.hrsa.gov, and it is a Medicare telehealth payment eligibility analyzer. You can simply put in your zip code, put in kind of what your services you're looking to provide, and it will tell you. So that's a useful tool to have. More often, um, the remote patient monitoring is sort of the more tangible and easier to bring into your clinical uh, workflow, I would say. In January of this year, 2018, Medicare adapted a CPP code, 99091. You, you will be familiar with this, I would venture to guess, in the next 10 years. It does not have originating strike site restrictions, so anybody can do this. Your patient doesn't necessarily have to be in a rural population, can be an urban uh, patient. It is unbundled, so you can bill this code as a, it's a, you, you can bill it once monthly, you can bill it at the same time as you're billing chronic care management if you're doing CCM codes. And it reimburses at about $59 per patient per month, assuming you've spent 30 minutes reviewing, which, as you can imagine, you can get up there quickly. And that can be done by yourself or by nurses, et cetera. This slide, I simply want to say that every state has different regulations. So this is particularly looking at parity laws for private insurers across the country. The, uh, if you're not familiar with what that parity law means, it means that there's similarity in reimbursement for a live or in-person service as there would be for the telemedicine delivery service. So to find out more information about your state, these are three good resources to look at. So the Center for Connected Health Policy, the American Telemedicine Association, and then the South Carolina Telehealth Alliance actually has listed out what services, what policies exist for Medicare and Medicaid. They also have links to many of the private insurers so you can see what their reimbursement policies are. So these are three great resources I would, I would uh, turn you to. So what we learned is a, a huge disease burden, there's a huge need for services in the southern region. <coughs> Telemedicine may pose a possible solution. I think it is a viable solution going forward, especially as we're getting more and more reimbursement, more and more acceptance of this by patients, providers, and also for our um, healthcare service uh, providers. And uh, the future is, is really here. So I think, I think this can work. There's growing evidence every day. There's new information showing about clinical outcomes, how they've improved with telemedicine.